somebody said something like, you know, when, when Hall and Nash were beating up all of these, these WCW guys, I think it was Nash said this. He goes, uh, you know, what the, what the fans actually concluded here was that the WWF was better. Yes. I was mm-hmm. like, well, he comes in. Actually, because... that's not really what they concluded. <laughs> the the WWF. If they thought the WWF was better, they would have watched WWF. Well, yeah. that's not what happened. Like I'm just watching this whole thing, and they're talking about anti heroes and and why the NWO got over and all of this and that and all of this other. And I'm just thinking, bro, everybody is so over analyzing. They have for 25 fucking years now. They've been over analyzing whether it's Oh, because it was more uh, edgy, or nobody wanted to see a baby face. They wanted to see anti heroes, or or uh, uh, in the '90s, society was all about this or that. Bro, no. you want to know why they fucking got over? Because first, you had two fucking guys that kept beating up like ten guys on that every fucking show. That was Nash's point. Yeah, but no, that was no. That's not his point. His point was they saw us and they thought that the WWF guys were better. No. You could have taken two fucking guys from Mars. You could have taken Martians down to WCW. And if they beat everybody up by themselves, everybody would have went like, oh, that's really awesome. They would have been like, Mars is better. You know what I'm saying? You could have taken any two guys. It doesn't matter where they're from. It's not about uh, edgy or, oh, you know, we were uh, we were anti-heroes. That's why, you know, we were heels, but we were cheered. No, you were cheered because you fucking beat everyone up by yourself. That's why. Remember, wins and losses do not matter. Wins and losses and beating up guys by yourself does matter. Yep. Like, this wasn't about, oh, you know, heels and baby faces. No, it was about when any two guys beat up ten guys on every show, they're the fucking baby faces. It doesn't matter if you think that their heels are baby faces. That's a baby face thing to beat up ten other people all by yourself. This show. Once again, the narrator says in his very melodramatic voice, WCW is prospering from Vince McMahon's creation. Oh, bullshit. So there's legal matters are filed and whatnot. They have to specifically clarify on air that Hall and Nash no longer work for the WWF. And we begin the tease for the third man. And before anyone asks, no, at no point in the show do they tease that or was King Mabel mentioned as a possibility for the third man. <laughs> So they talk about Hogan was being no, and booed. they flat out say the third man was probably going to be Sting. They did actually talk about that. Yeah. Yes. I, I, so Hogan is now getting booed. He's been getting booed for a while, actually. But uh, well, if I may say something about that, yes. they did creative editing. They did some oh, they did. Uh, some uh, Thunderdome shit right here. So yes. the story they wanted to tell was that he was getting booed at every arena. Okay, mm-hmm. but in fact, yes, there were some people that were sick of Hogan. But Hogan was still over as a babyface. Was he as over as he had been when he came in in 1994? No. But they did some editing where, like, Hogan comes out, and he looks at the ring, and then he looks all disappointed. And you hear, Hogan sucks, or whatever it is. I'm like, fuck, come on. He came out, and he looked at, like, Vader or something. That's why he had that look on his face. But this is all bullshit. But the best part is, they're talking about how nobody liked Hogan, and Hogan is booed, and he's just not over anymore, and, like, people are over it. But then, when they actually get to the reveal of the third man, when that fucking guy came out, the place went crazy for him. Mm-hmm. They're jumping up and down, and they're screaming, and they're so excited that he's going to come down and make the baby face save. So that was a uh, flaw in their uh, their fake history right there. Yes. So Bischoff and Sullivan, like, even before the NWO, trying to convince Hogan to turn, Bischoff claims, with a straight face, that he went to Hulk Hogan's house to try to talk him into turning heel, and Hulk Hogan told him, until you walk a mile in my red and yellow boots, you'll never understand. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was the exact line, but I do believe that this probably happened. I'm sure the conversation Because happened. Hogan very much, very much was against the idea of turning heel. Yes. So until he doesn't, and he calls Bischoff and asks who the third man's going to be, and Bischoff says, I can't tell you, Hulk. And Hulk says, that's fine, it's me. He volunteers. I also believe this story. And I believe that, and I believe what Kevin Nash says when he says, Hulk Hogan saw where the money train was going and jumped on. Yes. (laughs) There was way more honesty in this show than there was in the last one. So it's uh, Bash at the Beach, and Nash says there were 
about 12 people in the company who knew who the third person was going to be. The match is Randy Savage and Lex Luger and Sting versus the Outsiders and a mystery partner. Uh, so they don't mention this, but one of these three baby faces, I think it was Luger, but one of them is stretchered out. So we really got a tag team match on the show, which actually, come to think of it, I don't know if I've ever seen that show. I've seen the finish a billion times, but... It is amazing how, how famous and how, how much this worked when you really think about the storyline. So the storyline is that it's going to be Hogan, or it's going to be Hall Nash and a mystery person against three members of World Championship Wrestling. But the mystery person does not come out at the beginning of the match. So really, these diabolical heels, they're going to fight three guys all by themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay? So then Luger gets stretchered out. So now the story is that it's a fair fight, but the baby faces are at the disadvantage. That was the story that they were telling. And Hogan was coming out to even the odds in this (laughs) fair fight. That's what the story was. It was still WCW. Yes. (laughs) So... Hogan comes out, and no, they did not include Bobby Heenan asking whose side he was on. But Hogan, of course, hits the ring, and he looks at Sav- or looks at Hall, looks at Nash. He turns to Macho Man, and he drops the big leg. And I just mentioned I've seen this a billion times, but it's been a while. And you need to watch the people when Hogan mm-hmm. does this. Everyone oh. grabs the person next to them and points at the ring. Like, they can't believe what they have seen. It's history. It was... It's- it was like the Undertaker being pinned. Yeah, that's actually a great comparison. It was. It was that. Actually, I think the Undertaker being pinned was even more surreal. But the same ballpark, though. But it was similar. Yes. Yes, it's a very short list of moments in any of our lifetimes in wrestling that can compare it to this moment right here. And it's Hogan turning heel on Macho Man. It's Undertaker being pinned at WrestleMania. And there's I don't know if anything else. Nothing is coming to mind right away. It's on that level. Well, the Montreal screw job. Uh, that was days bigger, later, his, though. Historically, uh, I think that, that that just left everyone confused live. No, immediately I knew something was up. Hmm. I don't even think we were all watching together, were we? Oh, yeah, God, I was I was in a swim. A, you were at my house. <laughs> oh, it was November. I would have gone by then. Anyway, yeah, by the way, when you, uh, when you review this here and we talk about how Nash says shit about Hogan and everything like that, keep yeah. in mind that this was filmed when Hogan was in TNA. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. So... Place is going crazy. Fans are filling the ring with garbage. And there's a fan who starts to lose his mind. So they cut to him for a close-up because it's a great reaction shot. Yeah. And, and I believe this is totally legitimate, too. It might have been a plant, but I believe it's legitimate. This fan was so outraged, he then hits the ring to pick a fight with Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. Bad idea. I don't you know about win. hitting the ring. <laughs> it was funny because, like, Nash decks this guy, and he goes yeah. down. Then Hall goes over, and Hall is simultaneously legitimately kicking him in the head as hard as he can, but also stomping his foot because he can't help himself. Exactly, yes. It's a great moment. So Hogan talks about how in the end it was a good decision after all, which is true. And Scott Hall points out if Sting had been the guy, it wouldn't have worked. It had to be another WWF guy. (laughs) Paige is putting Hogan over for knowing the business so well. And I forgot to write down who said this. I think it was Nash. But one of them points out the fans wanted to see us get beat up, and we didn't give it to them. You know, it's funny like watching. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> they I, never did. I was watching this show, and it was it was like it was so obvious why it worked, and it was also so obvious why it failed. Yeah. And literally, it was everything that Kevin Nash said. They built up the heat, and there was never a comeback. Mm-hmm. It was just yes. heat, heat, yep. heat, 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 yes. heat out of business, which is basically what happened here. <laughs> Pretty much, yes. And I was thinking about it because you know, everyone talks about Eric and, uh, you know, was he great or was he terrible? Well, he was a little of both. It, the, 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 although I will say, before I go further on Eric, he went to the Hall of Fame tonight. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know what he called wrestling? No. Uniquely American. <laughs> Interesting. The one massively successful angle that he created, he yes. stole from a non-uniquely American promotion in Japan. Yeah. So anyway, did he steal uh, a bunch of luchadors too? The thing that I, 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 well, the NWO angle he'd stolen from Japan. I know. But anyway, the thing that I uh, that I determined when I was watching this here was that uh, Eric Bischoff and Russo and a lot of other nerds. 
all have something in common, okay? And that is that they can all start the stories, mm. but they are unable to finish the stories. Okay. That Eric is true. Bischoff had a brilliant idea. The NWO was brilliant. Hall showing up, Nash showing up, powerbombing Eric through that stage, Hogan turning, like all of this. It was fantastic, okay? However, exactly like Nash said, everybody wanted to see, to see us get beaten, and we just kept going. <laughs> and they kept going and going and going. For years There was and no years end. And years. The closest they had to an end, sort of, was when Sting was going to beat Hogan at Starcade. Now, forget the whole fuck up with Nick Patrick, okay? Do you guys remember the follow up to that after Sting beat Hogan? We watched it. It was all about Hogan yes. and getting heat back on the NWO. That was not the end. That was one little happy ending battle in a giant war that never ended, okay? So it's just like Russo. Russo could write a good first show. Russo could come up with a good idea for an angle. He had no idea what to do with the angle once he came up with the idea. Bischoff had no idea how his greatest angle of all time, he had no idea how to end it, and it never ended. Because the fact of the matter is, and I'm not saying that Bischoff is an idiot, but by the end he was an idiot. Any idiot can come up with a good idea. Any idiot can come up with a good start to a story. Any idiot. But to be able to play out that story to a satisfying conclusion you got to be good to do that and there are far fewer people able to do that than there are people that could just come up with a great first idea Rotten Canadians what's pants with these people? canadians pants and folks where the fuck do you find a pair of power ranger underwear that fits a grown and much larger by the way than a grown man they only sell them in kids sizes. what the hell do i do and i don't remember whether he called no medicine. shit they only sell them in kid sizes well they didn't think of that so he had to buy men's large fruit of the loom white underwear and then he bought like four pairs of the kids underwear and then the seamstresses had to cut out all of the power ranger designs and stitch them onto my custom made adult power ranger underwear the rib was this is the weirdest story you've ever told me if you enjoy these videos for just seven dollars and 99 cents per month you can enjoy full length editions of the Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.